morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for taking the time of your morning to um, join us for today's webinar on um, navigating pay equity in 2021. On behalf of everyone here at Proxis, I want to thank you for, um, for joining us. Um, and I think that this should be an insightful and engaging discussion. In a minute, I'm going to hand the program over to my colleague, Jim Jeffers, um, who is the sales account manager here at Proxis. Um, before I do that, though, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items with everybody. Um, first off, the webinar will be recorded, um, is being recorded, and you can expect to receive an email um, probably tomorrow with a link to the recording as well as a link to the um, the slide deck. So, um, you know, if you if you don't catch part of the program or um, you feel the need to take notes or something, um, you will get the slide deck and, and the recording after the program. Um, if you have questions as we go through the program, you can submit them through the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. And we'll be monitoring those questions as they come in and we will be answering them during our, um, our live Q&A session at the end of the program. If you have any general comments um, about the program or if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can use the chat button at the bottom of the screen. Again, that's something that we'll be monitoring um, and will respond um, if necessary. Um, and then finally, uh, the information being presented today is for educational purposes um, and should not be considered as legal advice. Um, with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Jim. Uh Thanks, Tara. Jim Jeffers, uh, Sales Account Manager at Proxis. Um, before we get started, I wanted to walk through the flow of today's program so we know what to expect. Um, first, we're going to explore um, the existing federal and state equal pay laws and how they apply to businesses in the area. Then we'll touch on salary history, um, laws in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and what you can and cannot do with those laws. Uh, next, we'll explore some of the trends and issues uh, surrounding pay equity, in the workplace today and uh, how your business can protect itself. And then we'll wrap up with a Q&A session um, and you'll have a chance to ask our panelists um, any questions you might have uh, or anything or anything that might come up during the program. So um, first I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have Dennis Shrek, who is the Senior Compensation Director here at Proxis. Dennis has over 20 years experience in compensation, program design, implementation, and management um, through everything from market pricing, salary structural, e structure, equity analysis, FLSA compliance, and more. Uh, Dennis is, helps uh, companies align their compensation in initiatives with their overall business strategies. And uh, next we have Michael Torsha, who is managing member of Siemenoff, Ormsby, Greenberg, and Torsha. Um, his practice is con concentrated in commercial litigation with a strong emphasis on employment law. He routinely represents and counsels local, regional, and national and international businesses um, of all sizes in state, federal courts throughout the country on variation of litigation matters. Um, we are excited to have both our speakers here today and uh, look forward to their insights into pay equity. And um, with that, I will let you two take the program. All right, thank you, Jim. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Torsha, and we're gonna start off with the legal side of this and talking about pay equity issues. Um, we're gonna talk right, get right into equal pay laws. So um, I'm gonna be speaking about two main areas, laws that don't allow employers to pay men and women differently. And then some of the questions you can ask or you may not ask during the application and recruitment process. There have been a lot of changes in that area recently. Um, as Tara said, I'm gonna go pretty quickly through these slides, uh, but this session is being recorded and the PowerPoint will be available. So don't feel like you have to write everything, write everything down right away. Uh, again, so here we go equal pay laws. First of all, equal pay, when we talk about pay equity, applies to almost anything associated with employment. So the pay equity uh, applies to recruitment, interviews, uh, the hiring process itself, promotions, discipline, transfers, and terminations. So it's really any type of employment related um, transaction that, that an employer might have with an employee or an applicant. And the applicants are very important in this process as we'll see in a minute. 
So the Equal Pay Act or the EPA is a federal statute and it applies to all employers. So those of you familiar with employment laws or maybe have heard me speak before about different employment uh, statutes know that not every statute applies to every employer. Many statutes have a minimum number of employees that apply to the business. Well, the Equal Pay Act does not. So if you have you know, two employees, then the Equal Pay Act applies to you. Basically, it says what you think it would probably say, that you must pay all employees equally, regardless of gender, sex, it says in the statute, for the same job. And if you don't, there are a variety of damages that you would have to pay or might have to pay, including attorney's fees. Now, when we talk about paying men and women equally for the same job, that doesn't mean the identical job. It means something that's substantially similar. So it doesn't have to be the, the precise job duties, but uh, that's an area that's often litigated, <clears throat> whether something is actually the same job or not. And the job duties, not the titles, determine the similarity. So just because two people have the same job title doesn't necessarily mean they're doing the same job. They could have the same job title, but do be doing very different jobs. Um, for example, we've seen you know, lots of businesses have vice presidents and you could have two vice president of sales, but they're doing very, very different roles and different job duties, even though they have the same title. Even though the statute requires you to pay people equally by gender, um, employers can have compensation plans based on factors other than gender. So if you have a, a compensation plan based on seniority or tenure, roughly the same thing, or merit, you know, how good people are, <clears throat> then you can do that. You just can't have criteria that's gender-based. Many times we see EPA claims that also come along with a traditional gender claim. So under Title VII, which is also a federal statute that prevents discrimination based on gender, we see Equal Pay Act claims and they come along with a Title VII claim or another state law claim. Uh, employees have two years to file a claim and due to some uh, changes in the law within the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years, eight, 10 years, um, the statute of limitations runs, starts to run again every time someone receives a paycheck. So if a woman receives a paycheck and that paycheck is a violation of the Equal Pay Act, every time she receives a paycheck, the statute of limitations starts again. So it's difficult to outrun the statute of limitations unless you're talking about someone really who left the company and is you know, suing the company later. So the EPA is the federal statute that applies across the country, of course. And then the state statutes, we're only gonna talk about Pennsylvania and New Jersey today. Pennsylvania has a similar law called the Pennsylvania Equal Pay Law. That's a state statute. That's the site right there for the statute. Uh, it's very similar to the federal Equal Pay Act. It also has a variety of damages, including paying attorney's fees and double damages. So if, it's, if, it, if it turns out that the employee is owed $50,000, then the statute would double that to $100,000. And as I said a minute ago, just like the Equal Pay Act might come along with claims from Title VII, Equal Pay Law in Pennsylvania comes along with claims under the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. So you get, you know, you get hit twice, employers get, could get hit twice with, with violations of, um, of this. As some of you might remember though, the Equal Pay Act does not have any minimum number of employees, but Title VII does. Title VII, the federal statute, has 15 uh, minimum employees. And the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act in Pennsylvania has only four. So if you have four employees or more, then you are subject to the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. Um, okay, on the New Jersey side, across the river, they have the New Jersey Equal Pay Act, slightly different name. It's more closer to the feds. That's also a state statute um, enacted in 2018. Um, that's, the, that's the site. They have a six-year statute of limitations. So employees can go back six years to recover the pay inequity if there is 
pay and equity. I keep saying employee can recover it rather than you know the woman um, because it's not a statute that says that's specifically designed for women, even though that's the public policy behind it, you can't discriminate based on any gender. So you can't discriminate based on male or female or however an employee identifies themselves, whether it's neither one or both, whatever it is, um, you can't discriminate based on sex and however sex is defined within New Jersey and Pennsylvania and with the federal government. So. Um, the Equal Pay Act in New Jersey also has a variety of damages. They treble the damages or triple the damages. Pennsylvania doubles, they triple. And there might also be claims under the New Jersey law against discrimination. Uh, that's the uh, state statute, of course, in, in New Jersey. So those are the statutes that tell employers, you can't discriminate based on gender. Kind of common sense for the most part, um, but uh, but there's, but there's many, many lawsuits based on that. The more recent developments in pay equity law are under the salary history laws. And what that means is, is not asking about salary history. So salary history, quote unquote, those laws prevent employers from asking about salary history. It's primarily to stop the perpetuation of gender inequity in hiring. So if a woman makes and you know, there's some different statistics on this, but if a woman makes 78% of a man in an equivalent job or 85% of a man in an equivalent job, you can imagine if a woman says, well, I, I make $60,000 a year and that $60,000 is less than the equivalent male makes. If she walks into an interview and the interviewer says, well, how much do you currently make? And she says 60. And the interviewer says, great, well, we'll pay you 62. But in the meantime, men are getting 68 or 70 or whatever it is. So it perpetuates that inequity going forward. So because of that, uh, that public policy and because of those assumptions, these salary history laws prevent employers from asking salary history. There's no national ban on salary history right now. There's no federal law that stops employers from inquiring about salary history. There are 21 states though, that do have a salary history ban and there's many little local pockets, county laws and local laws that have something like that. New Jersey does, as you can see from this slide. So New Jersey, New Jersey salary history law was effective January 1st of 2020. So we're coming up on what, two years now in New Jersey. And the salary history law, if you're in New Jersey, it's extensive. Essentially, it says what I just said a minute ago, that you cannot inquire about an applicant's salary history, benefits, or other compensation during the hiring process. So it's against the law, against this law, to screen a job applicant based on their salary history or prior wages or salaries or benefits. You're not supposed to take that into consideration um, uh, prior to making, uh, prior to making um, an offer. And then on top of that, you can't discriminate based on whether they're men or, or women. So there are exceptions to that though. So the general rule is don't ask about salary history during the recruitment process or the interviews, but there are many exceptions. And again, there are lots of words on these slides and you'll get the slides. So, you know, don't feel like you have to madly make notes. Um, so when can employers ask about salary history? Well, you can ask about salary history to, um, uh, if, if the employee voluntarily tells you, I mean, you're not going to ask, but if you're sitting in an interview and an applicant, you know, Shirley, Shirley's in the room with you and Shirley says, you know, right, you know, right now I'm making about $60,000. Okay, well, you didn't ask, you're not in violation of the law. She volunteered that. Um, you, can, you can ask about a salary or to confirm salary history after an offer of employment has been made, after you explain the compensation scheme. So I think Dennis will talk about this a little bit, but employers really should have a compensation scheme, a range of what jobs pay. 
So after you make an offer and after you say to Shirley, this job pays between 70,000 and 82,000, whatever it is, then you can ask, but you've already told her, you know, what the, what the salary scheme is. Um, you can consider salary history when you're making an internal transfer or promotion. So once someone's in the door and they're a current employee, then you can ask and, uh, and, and take that into consideration. Um, you can ask, you can ask salary history if the employee was previously an employee of your company. So if they worked at the company and then left and come and came back, you're not, you're not prohibited from knowing what they're, what they used to make, you know, at, at your own company. That's a, that's a strange one, but it does, it, it does come up every once in a while. And then finally, you can uh, ask about commission structures. So if someone is a commission salesperson, for example, you can say, well, what was your commission structure at your prior company? Did you get 2%? Did you get this? Did you get that? Um, but you can't ask what they earned. You can ask about the plan and the structure and the procedure, but you can't say, okay, well, you know, what did that, what did that mean for you in a, in a year? You still can't ask the, the, um, the, the, the overall the overall question. Um, and then finally, you can ask questions to comply with federal law or to state or for state law or in union situations or for civil service. And uh, some of you might be in that situation where you have a union, a union shop. The penalties for asking are um, $1,000 for the first violation, $5,000 for the second violation. You know, so we have these civil penalties in these statutes. But more than that, you're probably going to you're probably going to lose the applicant. If it's someone that you like and that you're trying to bring in, and we all know that the job pool right now is very difficult, um, asking these questions, even when you're allowed to ask them in some states, not New Jersey, uh, may mean a problem at the interview. Someone might say, well, can you ask that? Oh, well, yes, uh, we're, we're allowed to ask that with these exceptions. I mean, you're really going to have that conversation in, in an interview. So what many employers are doing is just simply not asking these questions in interviews, even when they're allowed to do it. For example, Pennsylvania, there's no general statewide ban. There's no Pennsylvania law that says you can't ask these questions. However, you, the Pennsylvania state agencies, if you work for the state, can't ask them if you work for the state. Uh, but in a private company in Pennsylvania, you can ask those questions unless you're in Philadelphia. Philadelphia does have a ban that started September 1st of last year of 2020. Uh, Pittsburgh has one effective that goes way back actually, January 30th of, of 17. And, and honestly, there may be other little pockets of places here and there. We do see some counties and again, local municipalities uh, enact these laws. There's some question about whether they're effective or not. So no statewide ban in Pennsylvania, Pen uh, Philadelphia, yes, Pittsburgh, yes, state agencies, yes. And you, you, if you're in a private company, not in one of those places, you might wanna consider why do it at all? You know, why ask those questions at all and, and, have, the, uh, and, have, and have the problem? So there are laws that say you have to pay men and women the same, or at least employees the same based on whatever gender. There are laws that say or limit your ability to ask questions about pay history so that pay equity is, uh, is achieved and pay inequity is not perpetuated. And then in addition to those two direct laws, there are some related laws and issues to that. And I'll just touch upon them quickly. I already mentioned there might be discrimination statutes um, in play. So if you get a lawsuit, you may also get hit with one of these other statutes. I'm not gonna go in, into great detail at the moment, but these statutes have um, other implications about timing, how long you have to file them, whether you have to file with the administrative agency or not. Um, and if we have time, I might circle back to that. But there are other discrimination statutes to be concerned about. Title VII, like I mentioned, the Human Relations Act in Pennsylvania, um, the law against discrimination in New Jersey. And then there are local laws as well. Um, again, some of the cities, Philadelphia being one of them, 
has its own local laws about, about uh, uh, discrimination and uh, pay inequity. These are some of the protected classes. When we talk about pay inequity, and I know we're focusing today mainly on gender, but when we talk about pay inequity, you can't discriminate against any protected class. Just because we're talking about gender doesn't mean that you can pay people differently based on race, right? Again, I think that's common sense. I think people know that, but sometimes uh, not so sure. But just let's just run through some of these protected classes. Some of these are very obvious and very common, and some of them are not. So, you know, the first on the left uh, side here, race, color, national origin. Okay, understood. Um, religion, age. Age is a little tricky because age statutes are not the same across the country. The federal age discrimination statute starts at 40. So if you are 40 years old or older, you are protected under the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the ADEA, that's federal. Um, that's also true in Pennsylvania. But if you're in New Jersey, the New Jersey state statute prevents age discrimination based on any age. So you can't discriminate because someone is too young in New Jersey, <laughs> where I guess you can in Pennsylvania. You could say, you know, how old are you? You're 22? Yeah, you're fired. Um, not sure why you would say that, but I suppose if you did, then you're, you're not in violation of the age discrimination statute in Pennsylvania. Um, disability. You can't discriminate based on disability, of course. And that, does, that means people who have disabilities, but it also means people who are perceived as or regarded as having disabilities. There are many, many cases where an employer thought that someone was disabled and they were not, or the employer thought they had a health condition or a disease and they did not, and they were discriminated against and they're still protected by the ADA, the American with Disabilities Act and the state laws. So it's people who are disabled and those who are regarded as being disabled. Uh, LGBTQ identification uh, on, on a federal level now, uh, that's protected. Um, sexual orientation, sexual identification is, is protected. So when we talk about pay inequity, that's not a reason to pay people differently. Most private companies with their harassment and discrimination suits do have restrictions on discrimination for sexual orientation, sexual identification gender identification. Uh, veteran status, whether you're a member of the military now or used to be a member of the military, that would be uh, uh, protected because of veteran status. Here are some that people don't think about. We start getting you know, a little lower on the list here of the less obvious. Immigration status, uh, um, that's tricky. It's a tricky area, but uh, discriminating against someone because of their immigration status, because they may they may hold a visa to work or they may be on temporary status. And there are some, some subtleties there about what you can do and what you can't do when it comes to immigration status. Workers comp status. I've had many employers over the years say, over the years say, I don't wanna hire that guy. I think he's been on workers comp at the last three businesses, you know, last three employers. I hear you, but you can't discriminate based on some the fact that someone has filed workers' comp claims, that would be considered retaliation for filing a workers', uh, a workers comp claim. Um, marital status, that goes kind of hand in hand with gender, but it also goes sort of hand in hand with the, with the next one, which is family responsibilities. Family responsibilities discrimination is actually, you know, it's a thing, it's a real, it's a real claim. Um, it's a real basis for a discrimination suit. Some people call it FRD, Family Responsibilities Discrimination, FRD. And that means that someone is being uh, denied certain opportunities because he or she is married, because he or she has responsibilities to take care of maybe um, elderly family members, or they have children or especially, especially young children where you will hear businesses say, we don't want to hire her. 
you know, she has three kids under 10 and she's going to be leaving every five minutes to take him to the doctor and to pick him up from school and to go to soccer practice and all this kind of stuff. And that's a form of discrimination, family responsibilities, discrimination linked, linked closely to gender, mainly affects women, but not always, doesn't always affect, uh, affect women. And then finally, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this last, uh, this, these last topics and then turn it over to Dennis. Um, when we talk about pay equity, before we even get to the question of gender or other protected classes or race or age or disability, you have to make sure we're talking about the right people. Um, very often, a worker will bring a claim for, for unequal pay and the employee um, will say, I'm not paid the same as the other person. And the other person's not an employee. You have to make sure that employees are really being treated like employees and independent contractors are really independent contractors. So the employee independent contractor issue is a big one and it's serious. And lots of lots of businesses get, get tripped up with the difference between employees and independent contractors. And then finally, um, we really don't have time to dive into the Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA, the federal statute. But those of you who practice in this area know the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act, is a federal statute that um, regulates and obligates employers to do a variety of things. Pay overtime, uh, well, pay wages, and pay overtime, minimum wage, child labor, there's all, there's all sorts of things. Um, but you need to classify people properly, exempt or non-exempt, you know, hourly versus salaried. So that's another way you can, you can have pay inequity for that. Uh, so with that, I'll stop the legal, purely legal part of this for a minute. And I'll, and I'll turn this over to Dennis. Great, thanks, Mike. Thank you. And I am going to... All right, hopefully everybody can um, can see my screen. Um, once again, um, good morning. Uh, my name is Dennis Schreck. I'm the uh, Compensation uh, Practice Director here at Proctus, Proxis, and we'll talk a little bit about um, pay equity issues and, and trends from, from an HR perspective. You know, Mike gave us sort of the, the legal uh, perspective, and, and I want to get into more of the HR sort of practical side of things. So Mike touched a little bit on the Fair Labor Standards Act, and, and you, you could do a whole webinar. In fact, I've done webinars on just that act alone. Um, so I don't want to get too deep into it. Um, but when we talk about fairness and we talk about equity, I, I think it's important to touch upon it. Um, so I just want to make sure that everyone understands that from the Department of Labor perspective, the presumption is always that the employer of the job is not exempt and eligible for overtime. So the burden of proof is always on the employer to prove that the employee is exempt from overtime and you can pay them a salary. So that's just a really important thing to keep in mind. And when I counsel my clients, I always say, if, if you're in doubt on a job and you could kind of go either way, you're looking at the duties test, always err on the side of caution and, and make the employee hourly and pay them overtime. It, it's just the, the, the safer course of, of action. You know, I just, I tend to be very conservative, so small C conservative um, on this point is always to err on the side of caution. And when we think about equity, we want to make sure that under the FLSA, we're not treating groups differently, right? So let's say you have one job, let's say financial analysts, right? And they're all men in your company. You got them all treated, you know, they're all exempt, but you got a similar job, let's say marketing analysts, um, and they're all women and you have them non-exempt. You know, that 
th those are things that you should be on the lookout for and, and really ask yourself, why are you treating these two groups differently under um, the FLSA? Um, when in the news and in society, when, it, when it's so front of mind, equity and, and treating people fairly, it, it's a good time to, to audit your jobs and make sure that you have people um, classified appropriately under the FLSA. It's, it's, it's always a good time to, to, to audit your jobs, but I think particularly now. I also want to um, amplify a, a little bit about what Mike said around salary history. Um, it, it is best practice not to inquire about salary history. And, and, and I don't care where you're located and what the, the state law is. Um, I, I just, I always counsel my clients, just, just don't ask. Um, because if you have a compensation system in place, okay, you've gone out to the market, you've gotten good objective market data for your positions, you've built a compensation structure around that market data, you have minimums, you have midpoints, you have maximums, you, you have true ranges for your positions, then, then trust your system. You know, it doesn't matter what they were getting paid, whether it was less than what you're, you're offering or more. If you trust your system, let your system be your guide. OK, if you have in place a step progression, and you're saying, OK, well, we hire at the minimum at zero years of experience and a little bit above for a year and two years. And, and when they have eight years experience, we hire them at the midpoint. Then let that be your guide. Don't don't look. It doesn't matter what the, the individual is, is making. So and also, if God forbid you get into a situation where you you are in litigation, you know, showing that you have a compensation structure showing that you followed that compensation structure is is only to your is only to your benefit okay instead of just sort of back and napkin in it so i guess the takeaway is have a structure trust your structure what are what are some of the current trends that we're seeing around pay equity and we're certainly seeing pay equity analysis, you know, we're having companies that are, are, are taking the deep dive into their data and into their pay and doing that analysis, you know, through doing it in-house or, you know, they're having a consultant. This is something that, that I do for a lot of our clients doing that statistical analysis. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later, um, but it, it's, it's a good thing to, to start looking at the data. And then doing whatever remediation strategies you need to do. You know, if it's doing adjustments to people's pay, if it's looking at your policies, and I'll talk about that as well. Um, you know, making sure that you're doing something to address these issues, you know, looking at the root causes of pay inequity. Is it because your performance management system is not truly managing performance? Is it because you don't have a compensation structure in place? So when you are hiring folks from the outside, there is no real structure. It's very subjective. It's whatever the hiring manager wants to pay for that position. You know, those can all lead to and, and have in them inherent bias that can lead to, to uh, inequity. Um, another hot topic is, is pay transparency. And and I'm slowly coming around to it myself. I, I, I am, I have to admit, I'm a, I'm a little old school. And I was brought up in compensation at that time when, you know, you, you tell the employee, you cannot discuss your pay with other employees. You know, we're not going to share what the ranges are for other jobs, you know. So I, I am old school in that way. Um, however, times are changing and it's, it's, naive for us to think that employees don't talk, right? They do. And you cannot, as an employer, tell them not to share their salary, okay? They have a right to do that. You know, you cannot discipline them. You cannot have policies that prevent that. They're going to talk. They have a right to talk. Expect them to talk. Some companies have gone to one extreme of pay transparencies. They will you know, you hear some of these big tech companies will just publish everyone's salary in the entire company. Uh, I, I'm not there yet. 
Uh, some companies will have their entire grade and range structure, you know, the minimums, midpoints, and maximums for all their jobs published to all their employees. Uh, I'm not quite there yet either, uh, but I'm getting there. Um, I would, at the minimum, make sure that you're sharing, if you have a grade range and structure in place, make sure that you're sharing that grade and range structure with your employee, okay? Um, because you're, you're making an effort towards pay transparency. And if the employee, you know, does feel that they are underpaid, they can raise that and you can address that issue. You know, if you have somebody with 20 years experience and you're sharing the range and they know the maximums up here and they're still above midpoint, they're going to have a question around that and you, you can address that. So I, I, I certainly would, would let individual employees know what their range structure is. And then you have to think about as an employer, where you are culturally, where you are in your compensation life cycle, how, how further along the transparency path you want to go. If you're just kind of year one or two of having a structure, I, I would I would wait another couple of years to people get used to it until you really start, you know, increasing that that level of, of transparency. How to mitigate risk. You know, Mike, Mike talked and, and shared some some great information around all these laws that, you know, and you know, treble damages and and some some serious risk as employers. So how do we how do we mitigate that risk? One of the steps, and 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 I would this is probably one of one of the first steps to take is is audit your pay policies, your guidelines, your compensation um, policies and practices for evidence of bias. Um, if you don't have pay policies in place um, and guidelines in place. Now is the time to put them in place because, again, anytime you have and you can show that you have objective guidelines that you are following, that is only to your benefit if you get into a situation where, where you're litigated against. Anytime the subjective aspect of something is taken out and is more objective, that, that's, that's good. That's just good best practice. You know, it helps mitigate risk, risk but it's good practice. It's more fair to your employees, um, you know, regardless of, 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 of the legal consequences. And I, and I think that's important to keep in mind. We want to, yeah, we want to mitigate risk, but we want to be fair. You know, we want to be fair to our employees as, as well. So make sure that you're looking at your policies, your guidelines, maybe have an outside person come in, give you a fresh set of eyes. You know, is there bias? Is there things built in there that, that is not fair to your, to your employees. Um, another point that you want to look at is your performance appraisal process. And I'll talk about this a little bit later when, you know, when you can have differences in pay and when that's okay. And one of those reasons is having a, a merit or performance-based different performance process in place that is a, a defense um, for paying somebody differently. So if that's a defense that you, you're going to try to use, you better make sure that your performance appraisal system is truly measuring performance, you know, is truly measuring what the, the what the job does. You know, is, you know, does do your employees have a good idea of, of what the performance standards are and what they are being measured against. And, and this is going to be as, as more and more states and more and more localities are having laws around pay equity as we see more and more cases in the court, more and more litigation, looking at your performance appraisal system will become more and more um, important. And the last point, is and I've talked about this, you know, having a structure, you know, having something in place that's based on on valid objective market data, not something that you're you're sort of back and napping. What are pay differences okay? You know, we're not we're not going to go and we're not going to pay everybody the same rate. We're not. Um, we are going to have at times when there are going to be differences. Um, and one of those differences, if you have employees doing substantially different work, you know, and Mike talked about this a little bit, you know, comparable, substantially similar and different work. 
Um, and when they're doing different things, truly different things, and particularly if you have a market-based compensation structure and you're market pricing those positions, and that substantially different work is valued differently within the labor market, then having that having a difference there, that that's okay. Um, the one thing, though, I would caution is you, you can't have the labor market, though, dictate differences in pay within the same job, right? So let's say you're trying to hire accountants, and, and we all know that the labor market right now is crazy, and we're doing everything that we need to do to try to bring people in the door, okay? And based on the market, you have to fill this open accountant position, and you had to bring them in. 20 grand more than what everybody else is paying. Okay. Um, so the market drove that, but they're doing some, the same job as your existing accountants. So you can't let that market be that justification for other people that are doing substantially similar things. So you would have to move those existing people up. Okay. Or at least show that you're, you're working on that. You know, maybe you're doing a first round of adjustments. And maybe in another year, you'll make another adjustment to somehow get parity, right? So you can't, you can't let the, you can't use the market as an excuse to say treat one individual differently. And, and that's something we got to be really careful about right now in this climate, in a tight labor market, where we are bringing folks in at higher rates, because we don't know what else to do, because we got to bring people in the door. Um, other times that pay differences are okay, if it's, if it's, somehow related to a reasonable accommodation for an injured, disabled employee. Um, you have employees that have different levels of ability, experience, education levels. Um, particular education levels will definitely show differences um, when it comes to that comparable work um, uh, uh, distinction. But you may pay based, based on seniority, right? So if you have someone who has and you're tracking this on your system, 20 years of experience in the role, and you have an individual that you just hired fresh out of school that has no years of experience, you're gonna expect that person that has 20 years experience to be paid more, and that's okay. Um, um, also, if it's a bona fide merit process, and I talked about that in the previous slide, you know, if you are differentiating on performance, having pay differences, based on performance is okay. Make sure you're tracking it in your HR system. Again, make sure your performance appraisal system is accurately measuring performance. Um, and then also incentive-based systems. If, if you have a commission-based structure or an annual incentive-based structure, um, if, if, if that's based again on legitimate objective performance measures and somebody's getting paid more based on that incentive system, that's okay. So when, when we want to look at and do some of this analysis and some of this equity work, you know, how do, how do we determine comparable work? You know, Mike talked about this, you know, and then the federal law makes decisions around equal work, state laws are, some, are sometimes different, you know, they look at comparable or substantially similar work, and, and it can get complicated. And, and as Mike said, job title doesn't matter. It, it, it's what the folks are doing. Um, so again, comparable work is substantially similar skills, responsibility, effort, and similar working conditions, right? They're in an office environment or they're out on the field or, 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 or they're in a direct patient care environment in a healthcare setting. Those are those similar working conditions. So comparable work, just to give you an example, you might have, say, comp analysts in the HR department. You might have marketing analysts in the marketing. They're, they're looking at data. They're making inferences, judgments around that data. They both require a bachelor's degree in a business or some related field. You know, generally that work is pretty comparable. That's something that you would want to look at um, in terms of comparable work. And, and are you your analysts as a whole is there evidence of discrimination or bias in your pay when it comes to, to gender or ethnic origin or any other of the uh, protected classes? 
Where it could be different, though, let's say you have an HRAS analyst, but that HRAS analyst, though, it's doing analysis, right? But they're, you know, specifically doing coding and they require a bachelor's degree in IT and a certification in SQL or whatever it is, that would be substantial. That wouldn't be comparable, right? That would be substantially different, right? So we got three jobs, all have the title of analyst in them, two of which we can group together, but the other one that we can't. So it's, it's important to, you know, read those job descriptions um, and understand what they're doing, because as in that example, it's going, it can extend across departments. It can extend across your, your business units. When you're doing comparable work analysis and you're looking at differences in pay, I, job titles can be a good place to start. And if you have your job titles well organized, your job descriptions well thought out, and the job titles generally reflect what people are doing, um, you'll want to start there and make sure that you're paying people fairly within those jobs. And then I always recommend them broaden it out, okay? Because you're also going to have people that are in single incumbent jobs where you can't even make a comparison. So making looking at the job families, if you have all the analysts in your organization in one job family or all the marketing jobs or how it is, broaden it out, look at your, your job families for evidence of, of, of discrimination or bias. Um, look at your EEO categories. I, I think that that's an, an interesting way to look at and a way to group employees and, and, and look for evidence of, of, of bias or, or discrimination. And it's, it's something that you know, the federal government uses. So we're sort of you know, doing something that's recognized you know, legally as a way to group employees. Uh, and again, other basis is of comparison, you know, your internal uh, ways that you group employees, whether you have middle management group is in, is in one group and executives in one group, um, or to my previous example, you know, looking at all of your analysts and, and trying to determine, um, you know, what jobs are doing comparable work and, and what jobs are not. You got to make sure, though, your HRIS system is tracking the right data at the employee level, right? Because you need, without the data, you can't make, you can't do the analysis, you can't make the comparison, whether you're doing it or you're having a consultant come in and do that. And I know a lot of us, you know, are tracking gender, a lot of us are tracking ethnic orientation, but think about all the different protected classes that Mike talked about, you know, are, are you tracking disability? Are you tracking veteran status? You know, are you tracking sexual orientation? You know, all of these different, you know, and age is something generally, you know, we will have in the system, but think about all these other classes and, and are you tracking them? Because if you're not tracking them, how, how can you know if you're, if you have discrimination there? So that's, that's something really important to um, keep in mind, because when I've done this analysis for clients, I, I can only, um, do analysis on on the data that I have. I can only compare groups where groups are identified. Uh, so that's that's a very important point. So going through a pay equity analysis is 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 great on a number of reasons. And again, I'll, I'll hit this again. It's we're trying to be fair to our employees, right? We want to pay our employees fairly. You know, we don't want to discriminate. Um, based on, you know, gender or ethnicity or, or any of these protected classes. It's, it's not the right thing to do. Um, so we want to be fair. We want to we want to get out in front of this. If we have issues, you know, we need to know about them so we can make steps to correct them. From a mitigating risk standpoint, undertaking a pay equity analysis does provide legally um, an affirmative defense. Um, so it's a very valuable step that employers can take now. You know, don't don't wait till you get a um, a, a lawsuit. You know, do it now. And um, and, and Mike might correct me on this, but at least and I don't know on, on every law, but most laws doing a pay equity analysis, it's not going. It can't be used against you during litigation, right? It provides for an affirmative defense. It can't be 
used as evidence to um, uh, to point paint what you're doing in a bad light. It, it, it's, it's really all, all to the good. Um, and this analysis is going to compare pay rates against different protected classes. And I'm not going to to bore you and, and get into all the statistics that, that underline it. But in a nutshell, you know, it's, it's looking at the differences between different groups in similar comparable work jobs and identifying where, where there's a, a larger than statistically significant, um, or I say statistically significant difference, right? Pay is always going to vary, right? Especially if we're using pay for performance or we're using seniority. So there's going to be swings in the data that just naturally occur. And that's okay. It's when you have differences that are greater than what could be expected by just normal variation. That's where we get worried. That's where we say, whoa, there's a statistically significant difference between the way that we're paying women accountants versus the way we're paying men accountants. Why, why is that? And when we identify those areas, then we dive in, then we do that further investigation and, and, and ask ourselves why, okay? So it could be all of those reasons that I talked about in the previous slide, could be pay for performance, could be seniority. Um, it could be any number of those reasons um, that having pay differences is okay, and that's great. It's where you can't explain it where you have a problem. So you're using statistics to identify a problem. You're diving into that area, trying to explain it based on, on the allowable reasons, and then when you can't explain it, you better go and fix it, okay? you better make that effort to um, make adjustments um, where, where necessary. So we have about seven, seven minutes, uh, six minutes or so left, left for questions. Um, that's, at, that's the end of, of, of my presentation. So um, Mike and I are here to, um, to take what, what questions you might have. Yeah, we had a few questions come in, um, and um, one was a really good question, and Mike answered it in the chat, but I want to elaborate on it, and I have my answer to the group. It was, uh, during an interview, can you ask, <clears throat> can an employer ask an employee their salary expectations? Right, so, yeah, the can you ask someone their salary expectations? The answer is yes. You can ask an employee what they would expect, what they would like to earn from the job. That's very different from saying, what did you used to earn at your previous employer? And you can, you can do that. Now you have to be a little careful, right? Because if someone comes in and says, I expect $50,000 and your pay range is 60 to 70, then if you actually pay them 50, you may be engaging in the pay inequity. Um, so that, that's not going to be an excuse later if you're paying, uh, you know, women differently than men or, or otherwise violating the statute. So you can ask that question on a related topic. You can also ask them about competitive salaries, not their previous employer, but if they're interviewing somewhere else. So an employer, uh, an applicant comes in and says, you know, look, I have to let you know, I do have an offer from XYZ company down the street and I need to let them know something. You're, you're allowed to say, well, what are they offering you? And, and that's perfectly fine. That's not salary history. That's not a previous employer. You can be competitive with, um, you know, if someone else is, is interviewing somewhere else. And I think that was another question we had, Jim, is, you know, what do you do when, when you're in this very competitive market here for employees? So that's, you do have the freedom to, to do that. Awesome, awesome. Um, another question we had come in are, uh, what are your suggestions for managing pay equity while balancing the reality of the current market where salaries seem to keep rising and incentives are needed to hire? You mean, you mean like other than pay more? <laughs> pay more money. Yeah, other than, other than pay more money to your applicants? Um, I mean, Look, isn't isn't that the answer, right? the The answer is the answer is 
be very competitive with what you're offering with comp with base compensation. I mean, people, people, you know, people out there listening to this probably know this better than I do. Um, you know, offer competitive uh, compensation, offer competitive benefits. Some people have signing bonuses. What we're seeing, what I'm getting a lot of questions on right now is, um, I'm getting a lot of questions about working remotely. Right, so this is the this is the age of uh, working remotely as a as a benefit. So I think a question just popped up, like not just yeah. applicants, but what about you know current employees? How do you how do you keep the current employees? And and again, I, I mean, look, part part of what I do in my own law firm, right, is I run a law firm, and we have the same issues that you all do. We have we have attorneys, we have staff. We're trying to hire people. We're trying to retain people. So. Uh, we're doing everything we can do to, you know, to, to, to raise salaries if that's necessary, to be competitive, to provide good benefits, good working environment and all of that. But we're getting lots and lots of questions about working remotely. Uh, that's become a benefit. That's become a, a central question for applicants and current employees. When can I work from home? Can I work from home under what conditions? So that's, uh, that's, that's sort of a new frontier here of... Uh, of, of retaining people. Just to add a little bit about that, you know, with, with applicants and, and how do you handle, you know, your existing employees and the equity issues, you know, first of all, it's, it's trying to get good market data, know what these jobs are commanding in the market. Um, and I know that's hard now, right? Cause the market is moving so fast, but um, you know, trying to get good data. And if you know that if, if anything that you can do to, rely more on sign-on bonuses where you're not putting so much of it on base and then you're running into inequities within your existing employees, I would try to do so. Sign-on bonuses, retention bonuses, those sorts of things are, are good solutions. And, and the other is just knowing that you're going to have to do something to your existing employees, you know, and again, you don't have to do it all at once, but if you're hiring someone that, you know, and you had to pay them what you had to pay them to get in the door, but they're way above your existing folks. You got to come back at some point and, and try to get those existing folks whole and, and up to that rate. And if you can't do it in one year or two years, but have a plan, you know, have a plan to, 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 to get them up to a higher rate. Thank you. Um, had a couple more questions pop in. Uh, um, one was, can you hire somebody based on experience at a higher rate for a job where there are other employees making a different amount? Yeah. Yeah, you, you can. I mean, again, you'll want to make sure that your job description, it makes it clear that, you know, there's their experience is an important part of, of that role. Um, but if it's if it's if this individual has 20 some odd years experience and most of your folks are new grads and you're bringing them at a rate and you have a compensation policy and structure in place that rewards for years of experience. Yeah. You can bring them in at a high rate. Yeah. Um, and then uh, last question we had that came in was uh, does Proxis provide a service where they do pay an equity analysis for companies? Uh, Dennis, if you want to elaborate on it, do a quick uh, sales pitch, I guess. <laughs> you're the sales guy, Jim, not me. Um, I, you know, we, we do, we do perform that service, um, for, for our clients and, and do that statistical analysis. Um, we also will, will look at your policies, your procedures, um, make some suggestions around there, but I do a lot of work around, you know, taking a dump of your, your, your HRIS, uh, data, doing that statistical analysis. And then it becomes a conversation where we're sitting down and say, Hey, we got it. There, there might be some issues here. There might be some issues. Your, you know, your um, field staff technicians, um, you know, your white um, employees are, are being paid much more than um, your Hispanic or black employees. You know, what, what's going on there? Um, so it's sort of shining the light and showing where you might have issues. And then it's, it's having those conversations and doing that further dive into the data and saying, okay, can we explain this with performance? Can we explain this away with years of experience? Um, and if we can't, you know, what are we going to do to fix it? Awesome. And then um, if uh, 
we're right up on that hour mark and I'm sure everybody's get on with their day, but if there are any questions, you can raise your hand and Tara will unmute you and you can ask them. Um, I'll give about 10, 15 seconds for any of that to come up. All right, perfect. Well, um, Thank you for the time today on uh, behalf of Mike and Dennis. Um, it was great uh, getting this information out to everybody. Um, as Tara mentioned earlier, um, look for an email probably tomorrow with a recording of this as well as the slide deck. And uh, we'll have contact information for Mike, Dennis and myself. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you can just uh, you know, shoot us an email or give us a, a phone call. All right, Th on uh, behalf of Proxis and uh, Mike and his team, uh, we wanna thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.